everyone, and welcome to our community conversation. <clears throat> I'm Chris Lindsley, the Senior Director of Internal Communications for the Medical System. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. First off, if you are listening on your computer, please turn your volume all the way up. If you're listening on your computer's speaker system and would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane on the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect those and address them um, at our next session. What we've done is we've, each time we capture questions, we're going to answer some from the last session at the end of this session, but we very much want those questions so we can respond to them all. Our two speakers are OMS President and CEO, Dr. Mohan Santa, and OMS Incident Commander, Dr. David Marcosi. Dr. Santa and Marcosi will be addressing several topics of importance to you and our communities. First, OMS COVID-19 preparation. Second, COVID-19 and your health. And finally, how you can help fight COVID-19. But first, Dr. Santa, can you please provide an update on the number of COVID-19 cases here at home and around the world? Sure, so thank you, Chris. And um, on behalf of uh, the entire University of Maryland medical system, I wanna thank everybody who has taken the time out of their busy schedules to join us in this important conversation and, and these important updates. Uh, as Chris described, and, and as all of us are acutely aware, this is a uh, international pandemic that has, uh, by definition, affected the world. Um, the numbers continue to change hour by hour, but as of 7.30 this morning worldwide, there were 487,000 confirmed cases, of which um, 11, uh, one, 117,000 included individuals who have since recovered. Uh, unfortunately, we have experienced, uh, as an international community, uh, over 22,000 deaths from COVID-19. Here in the United States, uh, we have 69,000 confirmed cases uh, with uh, just over 1,000 deaths as of this morning. In the state of Maryland, we have 423 confirmed cases, uh, and as the governor has kept us informed, and as the data tells us, we've had, unfortunately, four Marylanders succumb uh, to this disease uh, since uh, we started seeing our first cases. Thank you, Dr. Santa. Um, our first topic is gonna be preparedness, and I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Santa. Again, thanks, Chris. Um, you know, we are fond of saying through the uh, crisis uh, that what we need all of us to do is prepare, not panic. And this is the time for that preparation. But when you think of what drives the panic response, it is often anxiety and fear, and the way you combat anxiety and fear is with knowledge. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that we, we provide knowledge uh, to our community members so that we can um, rise to this challenge together uh, and recognize that this is a once in multiple generation kind of international healthcare challenge that will require all of us, not just those of us in the healthcare community, um, to make decisions that help decrease the impact of all of this on our, all of our collective communities. So the collective efforts in the community is all about trying to prevent further spread of the disease. Um, and that by doing so, that effort will help uh, to support the healthcare workers who are on the front line of trying to address the healthcare needs of those who have been impacted. There is no effort that is too small. Everybody plays a part in everything that we are doing. Um, what we are seeing based on the trajectory, the models of COVID-19, is that here in this region, we are likely to see an influx of patients in our facilities in the coming weeks. That has been the planning for this scenario, has been going on for now um, 
now more than a few months, and we are actively trying to maximize our capacity to protect and care for the patients and our communities. Um, we are and we will continue to commit the resources necessary that are critical to the work at hand. We are actively drilling with our response teams to ensure that we're well equipped to handle any potential surge and continue to provide high quality, compassionate care throughout our, com our community. Maximizing hospital space and resources um, to increase intensive care capabilities is critical to this. We are therefore in constant conversation with state and local partners to ensure that we're in alignment with the surge planning that is going on outside of our health system. We are very pleased that in this crisis, we are partnering not just with state and local officials, but uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Health System, the other large academic health system in the state of Maryland, um, to be able to create solutions. And an example of that joint partnership is a solution that is being contemplated at the Baltimore Convention Center. Uh, in addition, we're partnering with hotels around our communities um, to be able to address where we will be able to safely provide care to patients as they are identified as being a, a COVID positive or impacted by this disease. Our preparedness plan also includes efforts to limit the community spread by limiting the number of visitors that enter our facilities who unknowingly may be carrying the COVID-19. This is to protect uh, your safety as well as the safety of our workforce. So as of Friday, March 20th, we had a policy, a, uh, a visitor restriction that said no visitors would be allowed in, a, in our hospital facilities with limited and very specific exceptions. You should know that this decision did not come easily, but it was the appropriate decision and we made it in concert with state health officials and with, um, in this case, the Hopkins Health System to ensure that we had alignment between the large academic health systems in terms of the approach. We've also canceled routine health appointments through April 3rd at all um, facilities, and that will continually be updated as a consequence of the need to continue the social distancing efforts that you undoubtedly have read about and hopefully are participating in and educating the members of our community um, about. We've canceled elective surgery, again, in partnership with Johns Hopkins um, and we continue to update individuals about when that will actually, um, when we'll make changes to that approach. But for now, the time being, the visitor restriction policy, the limitation of elective care procedures, uh, ambulatory setting um, visits, and the uh, elective surgeries in our hospitals continue to be on hold in an effort to decrease um, uh, the spread of this disease. We are working hard to bring you up to date and accurate information. We're implementing protocols that have been laid out to, by the CDC at the federal level to provide the best care possible for patients of Maryland in our nation. So we're going to continue to emphasize to please visit in the medical system's COVID-19 response page and check back often because one of the realities of this crisis is that we are learning from information that we are gathering, not just from within the state, not just from within the nation, but indeed the world. And as we get that information, our policies and processes will continue to evolve in order to limit uh, the spread of this infection. So in terms of information that is important, most people, most people who are infected by COVID-19 will experience mild symptoms. Those symptoms can include fever, cough, shortness of breath. Based on the evidence that we have so far from the worldwide data, older adults and people with chronic diseases are most susceptible to the more serious complications of this viral infection. But I want to make sure that as people hear that, we are not saying that young people are immune to this disease. Right now in the state of Maryland, uh, with the numbers that I gave you earlier, half the cases that we are diagnosing are in patients who are between the ages of 20 and 50. 
And so everybody should take precautions. One of the things that we are concerned about is that as we delivered the message about who was at risk, there are those in our community who heard that and believed that the message could be interpreted as, and therefore they are not at risk. And therefore their behaviors um, could be different than the behaviors of those who we defined as being at risk. And this, what we are talking about is that everybody owns this responsibility. So again, it is really important that if you are having mild symptoms, mild symptoms, you don't come to the hospital as your first access point unless it is a healthcare emergency and unless you are concerned very specifically about your ability to care for yourself at home. First step is call your healthcare provider. If you do not have one or you cannot access your healthcare provider, there are also 24-7, we've set up a nurse hotline to talk to a registered nurse about your symptoms, and that will helpfully provide information that will help inform what are the appropriate next steps. Um, we are asking all of our community to not go to the hospital or kind, call 911 unless it is truly a healthcare emergency, because at this time, it is important to know that only healthcare providers can, or, can order the COVID-19 testing. It is not an appropriate test for everybody. And right now in the state of Maryland, we are required, all healthcare providers are required to follow the CDC, the federal guidelines for who is in fact for, uh, eligible for testing. So we continue to work with our healthcare partners within our system and around the state to expand testing capability. An important point for you to appreciate is that as the testing capabilities in the state of Maryland improve, you will see a rise in the number of cases. And there's a balance to how you interpret that. There is a balance because we know as we test, we will find it more, but we also know that the work we are doing around social distancing, as you see the rise, it does not tell us, it does not tell us that the social distancing efforts aren't working. We do have to continue that effort because only when all of the surge is done and only when we get to the back side of this will we be able to communicate factual information of the benefits of social distancing. But we know from history the impact it can have. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back over to you, Chris. Thank you, Dr. Sansa. Our next topic is what you can do to help. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Marcosi. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Dr. Sansa, I'm, I'm honored and privileged to be speaking to our community partners this afternoon uh, about, obviously, this growing threat to our community and our state and our nation. Um, <clears throat> It's, it's, it's important to recognize that we're all partners in this, and then we can all be virus fighters, and we can fight back against this virus. Each of us owns a piece of this response, from an individual in your home to uh, the folks who are in businesses to our clergy to our hospitals. Uh, it's important that we all embrace a piece of this so we all can muster the best response uh, when we have to uh, obviously move into a response posture. And right now is time to ready ourselves and do the right things within our communities and our families and as individuals to make sure we have the right uh, protocols in place for us as family members and we follow those protocols that are deemed appropriate by the CDC and the state around social distancing uh, to make sure that we limit the spread of this virus as Dr. Sumter said. That is what we all own. And that is what we all must do so that if we limit the spread of this virus, there's less of a burden on our health care system and more of us remain healthy throughout this challenge. So let's talk a little bit about uh, keeping ourselves healthy and uh, making sure that we're able to uh, do the right things for our, uh, our families, our communities, and ourselves to maintain our own health. And some of these are fundamentals, uh, like uh, washing our hands like uh, making sure that uh, we cover our mouth when we sneeze or cover our, uh, or cover our uh, mouth when we cough. These are the basics, uh, but we need to recognize that these basics 
are going to go a long way. And I know a lot of people are talking about, you know, we're short on uh, the alcohol, the, the hand sanitizers. But getting back to the basics, there's good old soap and water. And there's not just soap and water. It's about washing our hands, not just for a short period of time, but as my five-year-old says, as he was taught in school, sing the ABCs. If we're able to sing the ABCs through our washing of our hands, then we'll make sure our hands are more clean. Because here's what's important. This virus sticks around. And it sticks around on everything. On tables, on doorknobs, on uh, countertops, in bathrooms, on toilets. So when we touch something, uh, we realize that we pick it up with our hands, and then we touch our face, and then obviously we get infected from this virus. So not only is sanitation of our homes, our communities, our businesses, our schools, uh, well, our schools are closed, fortunately, uh, but our businesses are important, but we do this inside our homes, and then we wash our hands to make sure we're not transmitting this between people. And that's what's key, and that's what this slide speaks to with regard to recognizing where this virus could live. And, and let me all let you all know, this virus is going to not just live for hours, this virus may live for days. So we need to make sure we're doing this regularly and we're not touching something that we then touch our mouth or we eat something and this gets transmitted to ourselves. And that ability to decrease the transmission is key right now so we can all maintain our own health. So let's be mindful for, for, things, like, uh, for, for things like mental health. Because as we start to social distance, it does not mean socially isolated. Uh, and it's important to recognize that we need to stay in contact. We're human beings. And our clergy, our family members, our neighbors, all should be able to stay in contact with each other throughout this virus. And maintaining our own mental health is important. And we can do that through multiple different venues, whether or not it's through social platforms uh, or FaceTime or just a simple telephone. Uh, but it's important that we all stay connected because we're going to be going through this challenge together as a community, as families, as a, as a city, and as a state. And the more we'll, we stand together, the stronger we'll all be. So under that, I just want to make sure that we talk about a couple different resources. If you get to the point where you're thinking, you know, I really don't have anybody who I can reach out to or I'm not really sure of who I should talk to. It's important to recognize that anxiety from this virus is high. And the more we stay informed and the more we understand the, vi the impact of this virus, the less we'll have confusion and the less we'll have anxiety. The symptoms of this virus are very similar to a flu. Fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat. And here's what's key. A lot of the people who get this virus are healthy and stay healthy. Or, or don't have symptoms, let me say. That's a better way to phrase it, or who don't have symptoms. The concern is the people who don't have symptoms may be transmitting this virus. So our fragile, our elderly, older adults, and people with chronic diseases are the most susceptible to this virus and can have serious complications. So we want to be very wary that we don't transmit this virus to folks who are very susceptible to this virus. It does not mean that young people are immune. Nearly half of Maryland's cases are between the ages of 20 and 50. So everybody should take necessary, necessary precautions. And the teenagers who think they're invis invincible, they're not. They may not be, have mild symptoms, but they could transmit it to their grandfathers and grandmothers. So let's make sure that we embrace, all of us embrace the right things that we need to do to limit this virus. So let's turn it back to Chris for any further comments. Thank you very much, Dr. Marcosi. It's now time for your questions. So again, a reminder, please submit your questions. Um, we're, we're gonna answer some questions from the last session, but we very much wanna get your current questions so we can answer those in the next few days and get those back out to you. Uh, so we're gonna start with the first question for Dr. Marcosi. What advice do you have for people who live with at-risk populations, such as parents and immunocompromised family members? Yeah, this is what I was just trying to speak to. I think it's a great question, whoever asked it. So it's important to recognize that we recommend avoiding contact with individuals uh, who are potentially high risk. So who are high risk? 
folks who have comorbidities, who have COPD, hypertension, diabetes, heart trouble, those folks are at higher risk for having complications of this virus if they get infected. So it's important our children or those who are younger don't transmit this virus to those folks who potentially are of older age or have comorbidities. And the way we limit that is we don't, we stay, we keep our hand, hands clean, we cover our mouth when we sneeze or cough, and we stay about six feet from folks so we don't spread those respiratory droplets between those who potentially may have the virus and those who are potentially at risk from getting the virus. Thank you, Dr. Marcosi. Uh, next question, also for you. What is the best way to quarantine a family member? Yeah, this is a great question. So it's, it's not going to be easy. And we need to all think about how to best do it within our own homes. And each of us needs to figure out how do we keep our most vulnerable distant and don't get exposed to this virus. So that means cleaning high touch, freak, high touch surfaces frequently. And before and after, every time someone who's potentially exposed, we, 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 we keep those areas clean. It's also important to follow other guidelines, including, including covering your coughs and sneezes or frequent hand hygiene and making sure we stay up to date with the CDC website. Thank you, Dr. Marcosi. One last question for you. Is UMS going to start offering testing clinics? UMS is currently evaluating options for testing clinics. The procedure, the procedures for offering this service will align with the Maryland Department of Health's directive to make sure all testing is consistent with CDC criteria. We are also paying close attention to the state's plans to open testing sites at alternative locations and discussing this within UMS to make sure that everyone has the ability to, have to, 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 uh, uh, to go to these sites. Thank you, Dr. Marcosi. I'm now gonna turn it over to Dr. Sunset for some closing thoughts. Okay, so again, I, I want to make sure that we thank everybody for taking the time out of your incredibly hectic schedules right now uh, for this uh, informational update. Again, the goal that we as a health system have is to be a partner in our communities and to be a resource. And what we're trying to do with these updates is to provide um, you all as leaders in our community with information that you could then disseminate. Uh, the whole idea for us is to get to as much of our community as possible information that helps us all collectively prepare. So you've heard information about the value of social distancing and how maybe best to try and address some of the challenges associated with that. You've heard a bit about um, the information regarding testing that I'm going to ask everybody to continue to stay vigilant as information becomes more available. Uh, as we evolve our testing capabilities, you're gonna hear that our evolution will go from hospital-based uh, uh, testing, where we are testing those who come to us um, who are significantly symptomatic at the time of their presentation, to ultimately being able to test in the community. And as we test, uh, more of our healthy members of our community, how we are able to help socially distance uh, those members of our community uh, for the appropriate periods of time is a dramatic determinant of how we will actually be able uh, to define the length of period that we will be under um, the surge, the impact of a surge. Uh, we continue to um, uh, one of the other things I will tell you that um, as leader of this healthcare organization, um, I am uh, honestly sometimes surprised to hear a question that comes my way not infrequently. But maybe that speaks to um, our collective histories as, as communities, um, but there are some within our community who wonder still whether this is actually a real concern. Whether this actually impacts all of us or whether this is a, a conversation that has been blown up by our media, our colleagues, uh, or whether this is in fact, quote, a hoax. And what we wanna make sure 
is that all of you as community leaders understand that the healthcare community stands incredibly united in our message that this is real and this is not a myth and that we collectively, not just within the health system uh, of the state, but we as partners in the community have to own the responsibility of communicating accurate information. And that's foundationally why we're trying to have these conversations on a regular basis. So again, I want to say thank you to everybody who's taken this time. We will continue to provide these updates. Um, and again, I think collectively as a community, we will weather this storm together. So again, thank you for your time, and we look forward to the next time we get an opportunity to give you an update. Thank you very much, Dr. Santa. Um, just in closing, we hope that you will stay connected. You will find our social media channels displayed on your screen. We also want to remind you that we have other resources. We have an UMS COVID-19 website. Uh, go to our UMS.org website, and you will find that. We also have a nurse call line um, that's intended solely for people in our community to answer your COVID questions. So we ask that you stay healthy and take care of yourself, and we are grateful for everything you are doing to keep yourself, your loved ones, and your community safe. As a final reminder, within 48 to 72 hours after this webinar, you will receive the audio and the slides, um, and you will also get the questions, the answers to the questions that you've asked during the webinar. So on behalf of Dr. Santa and Marcosi, Thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.